Good evening, participants. So welcome back to lecture number eight. And today we are very happy and honored to have among with us uh, Dr. C.G. Shamala, Madam. She, as you all know, most of you all, is an assistant professor in the postgraduate department of English and research center for comparative studies uh, in Mercy College, which is affiliated to the University of Calicut, uh, situated in Palakkad, Kerala. She has uh, published several papers on diverse areas in select national and international journals and has also served as a resource person uh, in uh, different uh, national and international webinars, seminars and conferences. Her areas of academic interest include literary theory and criticism, British literature, gender studies and cultural studies. She is a member of the editorial board of select national and international journals and is also a counselor at IGNU at the Thirisur Center Kerala and is also the resource person for the distant learning program of the University of Cal Calicut Kerala. She is also the national coordinator of two MOOCs of uh, UGC CEC and I'm sure some of you all have definitely attended her MOOC course on literary criticism which she had organized recently. Uh, Ma'am on behalf of Team Dark Voyage we are really honored and uh, we are really privileged to have you again on this platform. People like you uh, you know always add glory and new dimension to this platform. We are heartily thankful and ma'am to have you today again. And thank you for taking up this important uh, and very pertinent topic uh, from the perspective of history of American literature. Uh, today you will be talking on American postmodernism. Uh, the platform is all yours, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. It's indeed my pleasure to be a part of this literary endeavor organized by Dr. Banerjee. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity. Uh, I'll see what best I can do. Of course, your queries are always welcome. And if there is any shortage of time, I do hope Dr. Banerjee will send me your queries yes. and I will be able to uh, answer yours. So without much ado, let's move on to American literature series where I begin with American postmodernism. Okay, <clears throat> now my uh, presentation today is divided into three parts because I thought the first part is about the period in the USA after the Second World War. What exactly was the socio-economic and political condition of the United States of America after the Second World War? That's precisely my first part. The second part of my slide will be about postmodernism. And the third part about literature in postmodern America or the literature of postmodernity as far as America is concerned. Now, let's begin with the condition of the USA. Uh, it is said that after the Second World War, I'll, shall I move on to the slideshow uh, mode? Uh, no, ma'am. So, uh, you you start yeah from the beginning. Yeah, that is the right. Uh, that yes. should be better. Yeah. All right. So uh, it was the USA had turned out to be politically and economically a superpower in the world. Uh, the main reason is because uh, uh, the main reason is the fact that the USA was economically and politically more powerful than the rest of the world. You might ask me why. Now, the whole world was divided actually into two blocks, the East and the West. And the East block, or where you had East European countries controlled and influenced by the USSR. And you also had the West block where you had USA. Now, Britain at this time had already been part of the world wars and it had badly suffered. Uh, it was just trying to come out of uh, the uh, economic as well as the political instability that it had faced as a result of the two world wars. So we find that the East Europe was trying to build itself with its economy. The East Europe actually had uh, 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 its infrastructure and economy wasn't as developed as that of the US. And so it took, it suffered heavy loss. And so it took greater time to come out of it. Whereas the USA, uh, if that formed the West Bloc, was far more advanced as far as its uh, product, military production was concerned, which it could easily deviate or convert into civic industrial production. So what was actually military production was easily converted to civic industrial production. And America could develop its economy continuously. Now, uh, it so happened that there was something was a cold war between this East Bloc and the West Bloc. And because of this cold war, the whole world seemed as if it was divided into two blocks, one under the control of the USA and the other by the USSR, which does not exist anymore. And in the East Europe, it was actually a communist totalitarian regime, probably that came under Stalinist control in the 1950s. 
and uh, hence you know uh, when you when you talk of the totalitarian regime uh, we find that uh, it wasn't as technically advanced or economically as powerful as the us but because of certain stringent measures as control over the economy and politics control over arts control over science you know having an iron shield uh, it was uh, felt that the ussr was trying to develop itself on a different scale much different from that of the way which the us developed and so in the uh, let's say in the usa the political regime found itself easily vacillating towards democracy and the democratic form of government uh, mainly because it was technically advanced and economically becoming more powerful but uh, it's also to be uh, mentioned that it was at this stage that we had something called the notion of the american dream where uh, the symbols of american comfort being high standard of living you have consumerism and owning a fridge having a car a tv were considered symbols of the american uh, comfort but along with this uh, we also had the, there was advancement of uh, technology and i would like to mention irving how Uh, who in his mass society and postmodern fiction talks about the way in which the media fostered the development of democracy at the same time it also gained control uh, of the government by the independent media there was also the dissemination of popular culture you had uh, jazz you had blues you had rock you had literature wherein you had comic strips you had uh, pornography uh, and all such uh, tv serials or soap operas and all these seem to have control over the government so everything was becoming more uh, you know not owned by the government but being uh, more of you could say independent hold over the uh, government or you could say giving more importance to a sort of a democracy that advocated uh, the uh, a propaganda wherein you have uh, rule of the of the, the people who are in control or people who are in charge now along with this there was also something that was of great interest was the society you know was uh, becoming more and more conformist in the sense that uh, or you could say especially in during the uh, mccarthy era you find that people were becoming more conformist now when we talk of uh, being conformist we also understand that people uh, suspected others to be in liaison with the communism of communist countries and those people or those individuals considered you know uh, uh, in liaison with uh, uh, what do i say the, the communists were persecuted and uh, similarly the ussr too you had people suspected of having collaborated with western countries for either imprisonment or they were sent to exile there was political persecution capital punishment death so all these things were happening in both the parts of the world and uh, the us society that was highly conservative also uh was becoming a part of racial ethnic tensions now apart from all this on one side we also have us military intervention in korea vietnam you know trying to say that the world need not follow communism anymore and that it showed its vehemence for communism and as a part of uh, you know showing the world how powerful it is you know the the two american nuclear scientists sl and julius rosenberg or the american nuclear scientists who were accused of Uh, the alleged espionage with our executed on june 15th in spite of worldwide protests so we found agreement between the state uh, of uh, state politics and public opinion you know uh, what happened was the economic prosperity and high standards of the people were actually in tandem with uh, the the growth of economy at the same time there was a lot of there, there wasn't any protest against the contradictions in the us the sense that the society uh, felt itself uh, moving uh, what do i say in a way in which uh, it could not say much with regard to uh, its 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 hold on public opinion if to sexual genetic cult in the us states of the supreme court's uh, proposal or you can say its verdict against racial segregation at school it unconstitutional we we do think um, what do i say people still holding on to ethnic and racial bias and as a result of this you have this civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s you have rosa parks um, 
one of the uh, women who, uh, who fought against a gender as well as the ethnic minority. She was actually in a bus uh, and at Montgomery in Alabama in 1955. And it was said that in those days, women were all, the blacks weren't allowed to sit in uh, the places where it was reserved for the whites. And when she refused to budge out of the place from where you know, that was reserved for the whites and who wants the place where the blacks were, were, were to sit, you know, she was asked to get, out, get off the bus, but then she did not agree. So this particular instance sparked the civil rights movement. You had European students protesting in France in various parts of the world against imperialism, conformism, colonialism, the military intervention of the USSR and its allies in Czechoslovakia. Apart from that, we have the Reformation. We also have, of course, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, uh, in 1963, uh, bringing in, you know, fighting for, against apartheid. And later on, we had the President John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy. Now, they were uh, pro-democratic and probably they were less conservative, uh, 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 you know, and for this reason, they were assassinated. So you find the people themselves being, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 there was, though there was widespread protest on one hand against imperialism, conformism, apartheid, colonialism, you know, military intervention. Uh, on the other hand, you have people saying that, you know, they weren't ready for such changes. And hence, we have many racist organizations like the African American Black Panthers. We also have the National Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, uh, the Hippies, the Flood Children, the Beats. And, uh, all of them, uh, you know, organizing themselves into groups wherein uh, they would fight against uh, such practices that the people were um, following, and that led to contradictions, chaos, uh, and all sorts of issues. And apart from that, another very interesting uh, point is that uh, you know there was a move towards nuclear uh, disarmament to have the fight against pollution, uh, creating ecological awareness social and giving importance to social and political freedom as well as personal freedom. So there was rejection of the Western values based on the, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition against conservatism. And there was appreciation for Oriental philosophies and religions such as Buddhism. Uh, and hence you had the Zen Buddhism, you also had people following pantheism and you have minorities and ethnic groups like the lesbians, homosexuals coming together People growing more aware about, becoming more aware of nuclear disasters, you know, the political manipulations, misuse of power and technology. And of course, you know, literature also uh, gave a lot of importance to ethnic, gender, cultural, feminist, and other studies in universities and institutions from the 1960s onwards. So, apart from this, there was also the opportunity for the ethnic minorities, like the Asians. You have the natives, you have the Asians who are settled in America for work opportunities and for equal, uh, uh, not only work opportunities, but also for equality in the sense that uh, for the sake of, uh, what do I say, uh, providing opportunities for all the minorities. We had lesbians, we had homosexuals, you know, and uh, the, the people were made aware of the misuse of power and technology, the Holocaust, especially and a mass killing of people, the incidents of bombs that were dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. So as a result of this, people started uh, to, to ponder over the, the condition of the innocence. Now, why should the whole of Japan be punished for the sake of the military ambitions of a few? So you had studies related to uh, technology, studies related to military technology, ethnic, gender, cultural, feminist studies, all of them concentrating on uh, economic and political instability or contributing to an understanding of why political and economic instability should be uh, the reason why the innocents suffer. So it wasn't only the, the misuse of power, it wasn't only the reason of military expansion, but they also found the importance be given to military to be uh, responsible for the destruction of uh, uh, property and human life and property. Now, so far as the 1970s were concerned, uh, that was the time when uh, there was a lot of economic reforms, you know, political economic consolidation in America. And as a result, it was quite stable then. But the 1980s, again, you had Ronald Reagan coming up with his uh, space exploration programs. 
and you find uh, as a result of space exploration program for probably to be used for peaceful purposes where you had advancement in the field of science and technology, not exactly for military purposes, but to establish itself as a dominant power that controls the space. Again, this element of control, the element of terror, the element of fear was evident even in the American foreign policy. But uh, even though US was uh, emerging as a superpower, on the other hand, we have the USSR disintegrating or we find the collapse of such totalitarian regimes with the announcement of perestroika and glasnost programs by Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the then president of the former USSR. And perestroika is, is generally restructuring. They want to restructure the economy. They want to restructure, um, what do I say, they, not, not the USSR economy, its political stance, and glasnost. Glasnost is being open. So whatever was uh, behind the Iron Curtain, you know, it was all uh, shattered. So USSR are disintegrated under the leadership of the Mikhail Gorbachev. At the same time, the USA, the Watergate scandal. Now, the Watergate uh, scandal by President Richard Nixon uh, was actually charged uh, for covering up the scandal by uh, you know, that had developed at Watergate, where five burglars were actually arrested, and some of them were said uh, to have had connections with the CIA. And uh, for this Watergate scandal, uh, Charles Wendell Colson, who was uh, responsible for playing such dirty tricks in politics when uh, the Watergate scandal actually appeared, but uh, President Nixon trying to cover up the whole issue led to his removal from the office. Now, this is nothing new to America. We also have uh, later on, we have President uh, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, uh, a here with, uh, who was, um, uh, who became infamous for his, for, uh, you know, his misbehavior with Monica Lewinsky. So we had a lot of manipulation with facts, a lot of issues taking place. And as a result of it, you have the role of the television media also gained prominence in the USA during the 1970s, 80s, and even in the 90s. But then it is believed that the raw media had both positive as well as negative influence. Now, the Canadian theorist, uh, you had Marshall McLuhan. Uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan, uh, in his book, Understanding Media, that was published in 1964, uh, talked about the uh, glorified, the democratic character and the cultural role of the media. So this is what he gives a lot of importance to culture, art, and literature, as well as the American society was concerned, and the ways in which uh, Marshall McLuhan elaborated, you know, uh, how the uh, the cultural role of the media played a, a dominant, uh, had, a, had, a, had a great role to play as far as uh, its, its, its relation to art, culture, and literature was important, gives us an idea as to how the society shifted from being industrial to post-industrial, as explained by Frederick Jameson, from traditional to mass culture, excess by Irving Howe, and also a cultural atmosphere, new sensibility, uh, proposed by Susan Sontag, where you had the American uh, postmodern literature uh, rested, and that affected the sensibility and cultural condition through artistic forms. Now, there were five main areas that, uh, or five main domains that were responsible, or you, you could say that the formation of mass society, uniformity and consumerism related to popular culture, how an individual becomes not only a part of the everyday goods, but also of culture and the artistic products through the availability in shops and on media. So uh, how does an individual become a part of a popular culture? Or how does an individual not only become a part of the everyday goods, but also of the culture and the artistic products that are being produced, making it available in shops and on media. Now, the second is the impact of new media, technology, popular culture, simulating you know, different perception of the reality at the individual level. So we not only give important television, video, or films, or DVD, CD-ROMs, but also to personal computers, internet, the electronic mail and cellular phones. And the next is the eradication of the difference between the high and low cultures or the popular culture in literary and artistic movements. Of course, I'll be elaborating all these points later on. And the fourth point is the realization of uh, the development of a fragmented and irrational subject. Earlier, we did not understand what's identity. We did not know what's identity and difference. But now we give importance to a fragmented and irrational subject because of sexual agenda or social and ideological connections. 
and or as a result of which it is constructed rather than recognized as something which is natural started to be intensively discussed of the civil rights movement and after and finally how was it that several themes like uh, you know related to pornography sexuality homosexuality lesbianism which were considered deviant in the earlier periods or you know that even sadomasochism or sodomy uh, was parodied or, or even depicted in uh, literature later on. so all these are the five important uh, what do i say uh, five important uh, you can say outcomes or five important areas or five important uh, ways in which we find the postmodern sensibility or the postmodern cultural condition entering artistic forms or influencing artistic forms first is the formation of the mass society there you have the consumer culture second is the impact of new media technology and popular culture the eradication of the difference between high and low cultures the different understandings of identity in the sense that how is identity formation uh, you know which was once considered uh, solitary unified or whole uh, you know is found to be fragmented and irrational and finally you have taboo themes and subjects entering literature and how do you think they influenced uh, you know uh, postmodernism now i with this i would now enter postmodernism and uh, yes now the the term postmodernism was actually uh, used in the 1870s uh, you know in various areas and it was john watkins chapman who first declared or who somebody who announced something known as a postmodern style of painting to go beyond french impressionism and j m thompson in his 1914 article in the hibbert journal which is a quarterly philosophical review he talked about the ways in which you have this raison d'etre be, or becoming the most important reason or the purpose of existence of postmodernism now this is because it wanted to escape the double mindedness uh, and to extend it into religion as well as theology and to get an idea of what it is to be a part of the catholic tradition so we find here uh, what, what do i say uh, you find the rejection of dramatic principles or even practices and we also find people actually uh, reacting against the dramatic principles or established practices of modernism and uh, first modernism is considered a movement in architecture where you also have elements of uh, informal styles playful illusion decoration and complexity uh, entering into uh, all forms of art so what was once considered uh, the double mindedness of modernism you know by be, uh, by being thorough in its criticism by extending it to religion as well as theology to catholic feeling became something of a rejection of the dogmatic principles and practices of established modernism in architecture and in other art forms and that later could be applied to host of movements in art music literature a range of tendencies in the imperial space of capitalism called modernism wherein that was marked by the revival of historical elements and techniques now in order to before we move further i thought i would just uh um, in in a very concise manner explain the differences between modernism and postmodernism uh, i have come to know that you already had a class on modernism in the morning session but then i thought i would just uh, elaborate a little bit about modernism that would facilitate me to enter postmodernism now modernism uh, began in 1890 roughly around 1890 until 1945 wherein you had the second the end of the second world war and uh, of course it was based on using uh, rationality uh, being logical to gain knowledge and there was a certain hierarchy an organization of uh, being maintained and knowledge was considered to be determinant but after second world war uh, this application of logical thinking was totally done away with and there was a sort of anarchical non totalized and indeterminate state of knowledge being predicted now the modernists they tried to search for an abstract truth of life and they constructed a coherent world view where an art and literature considered to be a unique creation of the artists whereas you have the postmodern thinkers uh, post, sorry it's not modernist it's postmodern thinkers uh, they mentioned that there's no universal truth and that everything is abstract or you know otherwise attempts to remove the difference between high and low uh, was done 
the advent of computers, media and advancements in technology, television, computers uh, ruled the world or it became quite dominant. Whereas in modernism, you had a fragmented view of human subjectivity in history. And this fragmentation was considered tragic or that led to lamentation and moaned uh, the loss of uh, either a value, loss of a principle, loss of certain uh, ideologies. So it, it, was, it was presented to be something very tragic. Whereas postmodernism doesn't lament the idea of fragmentation, provisionality, or even co coherence. In fact, it celebrates it. Now, modernism gave a lot of importance to ideas, values, beliefs, cultures, and norms of the West. That's why they talked about the, some, the, the loss of you know, an ideology, the loss of faith, the loss of beliefs or culture was moaned or lamented as T.S. Eliot lamented in his Wasteland, uh, where he lamented the loss of spirituality. He thought uh, you know, the, uh, England under the, uh, what we call a spiritual aridity of England or the loss of values of Christian uh, principles or the norms of the West in his Wasteland. So you find him lamenting there, searching for coherence, searching for uh, you know, a place where he could bring out bring in unity or bring in or he could sustain the ideas or values or beliefs. The search was there in his poem. There he presented the fragmented view of human life. But postmodernism rejects Western values and beliefs, uh, you know, because he finds that to be or he finds them to be only a part of human experience and such ideas, beliefs, cultures and norms were rejected. Now, modernism attempts to be the profound truths of experience and life, whereas postmodernism was suspicious of being profound because they thought that such ideas you know, related to the profound truths of experience and life were a part of the Western value system, which they negated. And modernism attempted to find depth and interior meaning beneath the surface of objects and events, whereas postmodernism dwelt on the exterior image. Uh, you know, it does not draw any conclusion. It doesn't suggest underlying meanings associated with the interior of objects and events. Now, modernism, uh, it wanted to present or it focused on uh, presenting a united vision in a particular piece of literature. So there is one, there's something called coherence. There's something called a unite, there's something called a whole, which was, uh, which was not fragmentary, uh, uh, which was not contradictory, which was not ambiguous. So it was something that was specific, it was something that was finite. Whereas postmodernism talked about the human experience that was unstable, contradictory, ambiguous, indeterminate, you could say jagged, the sense that this fragmentation or ambiguity gave rise to a world or you can say a jagged world. And modernism you had modern authors there to guide and control the reader's response of the book. So the autonomy of the uh, reader wasn't there or uh, the works were mainly, mainly controlled by the authors themselves. So it was more of an author-centered approach to literature, whereas postmodernism was more open. So the reader could apply his own connections. He could make his own assumptions, connect them, work out suggested meanings or alternative meanings to provide his own unguided interpretation. And then now we move on to literature. Uh, so we talked of postmodernism. We talked of what is it is it, or what is that being postmodern? Now, when it comes to literature, there is still more to talk about in the sense, how do you think this condition of postmodern or being postmodern was exhibited in literature? Now, it is said that the idea of literary postmodernism was unofficially announced in the United States with the first issue of Boundary 2, which is a journal. And this Boundary 2 is a journal, it was subtitled Journal of Postmodern Literature and Culture, which appeared in 1972. Uh, with the internal figures were David Anson, Charles Olson, John Keats, Black Mountain College School of Poetry. And even now, Boundary 2 remains uh, one of the most uh, influential journals in postmodern circles. And the postmodern writing, when we talk of postmodern literature, we find that it was this journal that officially announced the entry of postmodernism, or one could feel the entry of postmodernism or postmodern techniques in literature. And uh, postmodern writing. Uh, what can you say about postmodern writing? Now, postmodern works were seen to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving against uh, enlightenment thinking and modernist approaches to literature. And uh, we have uh, techniques like fragmentation, you know, questionable narrators were part of, uh, uh, what do I say, paradox, questionable narrators 
you know, all these were entering into literature and they often resorted to irony, faithfulness, black humor, employing pastiche, intertextuality, metafiction, historiographic metafiction, temporal distortion, technoculture and hyperreality, paranoia, maximalism, minimalism, uh, magical realism. So all these were made a part of postmodern writing. These, these are the characteristic features of postmodern writing. Now let's move on to some of these features. We just discuss each one. Uh, and the first thing that I would like to talk about is the ways in which the postmodern writers showed their frustration after the Second World War, the Cold War, the political instability, the economic, uh, being economically underprivileged or not being able to realize their dreams or even uh, whatever, whatever they want through uh, several novels. I, I should think rather than uh, talk about the prose or poetry, I would first enter into the characteristics of postmodern writing that is quite evident in the novels that were written. And uh, we also had the uh, black humorists like John Barth, Joseph Hella, William Garrett, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, Bruce J. Uh, Friedman, discussing these subjects in a very playful and humorous way. Now, it was known as black humor because uh, all those incidents that were equally frustrating or that were not only frustrating but also dehumanizing uh, were uh, amalgamated into ways in which they could make it playful, uh, in which they could incorporate something as black humor and in which these the grave incidents were present in a very in a very humoristic or in a, in a very playful or a very humorous manner. Probably that is why it's called black humor. We also roll in about the pleasure of the text and as, as, a, as, a, as a glaring example. You have all have Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Uh, that, that's why we have this, uh, where he talks of, I, you have the situation of Catch-22 situation. Thomas Pynchon in The Crying of Lot, um, Lot 49, where you have uh, two important characters called Mike Fallopin and Stanley Kutex. You also have them uh, being there in, in a radio station called KCUF. But then, you know, these they engaging themselves in playfulness and silly wordplay, but whereas you know uh, the subject matter of the whole, uh, uh, the subject matter of the uh, novel is quite serious and complex. Now we have also have pastiche. Now what is just as you have uh, something as a collage, wherein you have something, you know, you you have uh, you know, something being brought together, making collage a painting. Here you have is combined to paste together certain elements. So these elements could be from previous genres or styles of literature to create a new narrative voice or to comment on the writing of the contemporaries. Uh, you have something known as this, this particular method known as pastiche. And that's also a technique where you have cut up technique also, you know, you have this used by William S. Burrow, uh, Burroughs, where he uses science fiction, detective fiction, co combining them, making them one. Similarly, Margaret Atwood also bringing in science fiction and fairy tales, Thomas Pynchon, using different elements of detective fiction, science fiction, war fiction. And uh, one of the best examples is Robert Hoover's The Public Burning, published in 1977, where he, talk, he talks about history there. He gives improper accounts of Richard Nixon, interacting with historical figures and uh, fictional characters like Uncle Sam and Betty Crocker. Another example is B.S. Johnson's The Unfortunate, that was published in 1969. But then the most important part of this publication was that it was released in a box. There was no binding and the readers could assemble it however they wanted. Now comes intertextuality, again, a term that was coined by the post-structuralist Julia Kristeva in 1966. And uh, this de de definitely means shaping of texts or the meanings in text by other texts. How does an author uh, uh, you know, easily borrow and transform uh, some material of a text to another and using that as a reference in another text so that another reading could be made. So what happens is you have as many meanings to be made from the authors, you know, uh, so that they do not adhere to the original version. They could, have, they could apply it in a very different manner and a stylish way of talking about allusion and influences uh, the critic William Irving. And what happens here is that uh, a particular novel or a text is interwoven in the fabric of literary history, or you find it bearing relationship with other works. So some certain critics do say that this is an indication of the postmodern lack of original reliance on cliches. But then one could say that intertextuality in postmodern literature uh, is a reference of parallel to another literary work, forms a part of an extended discussion of a work, or it could also be the adoption of a particular style. 
and uh, we have marked it as with Donald Bartlett, uh, also talking about uh, such popular genres and taking in or easily borrowing from other texts, uh, you know, involving genres as science fiction and detective fiction. Now, George Borges, you have Kirdi Menard, author of, of the Quixote, which makes reference to Don Quixote. Of course, it, Don Quixote is an example of uh, the ways in which it was used extensively. Uh, we have uh, uh, Kathy Acker's novel, Don Quixote, which was a dream. Again, you also have John Bath, the Scott Peake factor, which deals with Abyssin uh, Cook's poem bearing the same name. We, so you find how Don Quixote is uh, generally used as a uh, reference with postmodernist. Now, there is also Pinocchio in Venice, uh, where you have, uh, where there are links to Pinocchio, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, Umberto Eco's uh, The Name of the Rose, uh, take, takes on the form of a detective novel and makes reference to Aristotle, Arthur Conan Doyle, and Borges. Now, moving on to metafiction. Now, what is metafiction? Is, uh, you know, essentially writing about writing, where the reader is uh, an attempt to make the reader aware of the fictionality of writing. And it allows, sometimes this technique allows uh, the, the, the author to shift in narrative, to jump in time, to move ahead of time or to move back time, to maintain emotional distance as a narrator. And so you find this uh, an important part of both modernist and postmodern literature. Now I have, a, I have several works here. At Swim Two, Birds by Flan O'Brien, Stephen King's Mystery and Secret Windows, Secret Garden. Ian, you have Ian McEwen's Atonement, the Counterfeiters by Andre Gide, John Irving's The World According to God Alone on a Wide, Wild, Wide Sea by Michael uh, Mopugo, A Portrait of the Artist's Young Man by James Joyce, Oracle Night by Paul Oscar, More Bears by Ken Nesbitt, and you also have Coleman's City of Angels. Now comes historiographic metafiction. Now, this particular uh, term, historiographic metafiction, was coined by Linda Hutchin, and she she uses this term to refer to works that fictionalized historical events or figures or actual uh, historical events or figures or even characters. And uh, best example is uh, Garcia Marquez is the general in his labyrinth about uh, Simon Bolivar. Similarly, Julian Barnes, whose Flaubert's parrot is about Gustav Flaubert. Ragtime, you have uh, by uh, Doctor uh, features uh, Harry Hugeny, Henry Ford, Archduke, Franz Ferdinand of Australia, Booker T. Washington, Freud, and Carl Jung. Now, we also have other examples like uh, Rabbi Halam Dennis, a cool age, the art of war, where he talks about Lebanese civil war and several political figures coming up there. Thomas Pinchus, Mason, and Dixon. Uh, you have George Washington, the smoking uh, marijuana, and uh, John Fowles, the French lieutenant's woman dealing with the Victorian period. And the author, Death of the Author by Roland Barthes, uh, if you want to take critical theory, uh, you know, where he has made use of the element of, uh, to a certain extent, about the art of critique. Uh, critique. And next we have temporal distortion. Now, temporal distortion is uh, closely related to fragmentation and non-linear, uh, 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 what do you say, narrative, or you could say non-linear uh, narratives that are featured in both postmodern and postmodern literature. How is it that uh, you have anachronisms? How is it that there is uh, cultural historical references that do not appear to be appropriate or they don't fit in? For example, in Flight to Canada, Ishmael Reed uh, uh, deals briefly with anachronisms like Abraham Lincoln using a telephone, you know, where at a time when, you know, so, so, so there you have this overlap of time repetition bifurcating to multiple possibilities. You also have Robert who was a babysitter from Pitsongs and, um, Deskins, where you have uh, different events happening together. So you have a babysitter being murdered, nothing happens, and then the story has another version. So you do not know which is the correct version of this particular story. Next, go to techno culture and hyper reality. Now, this in, the, in, in, in an essay bearing the same name, Frederick Jameson calls postmodernism the cultural logic of late capitalism. Now, he felt that the society has moved beyond capitalism into an age of the information where uh, the people are constantly bombarded with advertisements, videos, and product placement. And so many postmodern authors reflect this in their work by inventing products that mirror actual advertisements and place their characters in situations in which they cannot escape technology. So what happens as a result of this invasion of 
uh, or what happens as a result of the invasion of technology in the lives of people. So that's why we have Don Z. Lillos, the American writer, uh, Don Z. Lillos, White Noise, where you have characters are bombarded with the white noise of television, product names, cliches. Similarly, the cyberpunk fiction, which I'll be dealing with later, of William Gibson, Neil Stephenson, uh, use several sci-fi techniques to address postmodern hyperreal information bombardment. A subgenre of science fiction is steampunk, where you have Alan Moore, James uh, Blaylock, demonstrating postmodern pastiche, temporal distortion, focusing on techno culture and the futuristic technology and Victorian culture. Now, at this juncture, I would like to talk something about late capitalism or uh, the, the importance of postmodernism or the cultural logic of late capitalism by Frederick Jameson, where he makes a connection between capitalism and postmodernism. Uh, the reference here is to Ernest Mendel first, who recognizes three stages of capitalism. And uh, he uh, giving a more importance to the third stage, which he called generalized universal industrialization that happened after 1945. Now, this alternate name for this stage is advanced capitalism, wherein Frederick Jameson says how industrialization, commodity, culture have invaded everyday life. So you don't have any the connection that's made between capitalism and postmodernism. You know, what does it give rise to? How do mass media consumerism, globalism, and the corporations enter, or how do they affect everyday life of people? Not affect, they not only affect, but they invade everyday life. That's why we have no the fragmentation cannot be considered an obvious center. You have Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club, Joseph Heller's Catch 22 as glaring examples. Again, another most important theme that you find in postmodern fiction is paranoia. So that this is just a belief that there is an ordering system behind the chaos and confusion in the world, but there, there, nothing of this sort exists. And the search for this order is fruitless and absurd. Pensions, the crying of lot uh, 49, uh, presents a situation where, when there, there could be a coincidence or a conspiracy who will joke. And that coincides with the theme of techno culture and hyper reality. In Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut, you have a character called Dwayne Hoover who becomes violent when he's convinced that everyone in the world is a robot and only he is a human. I wish everybody would read this particular work because uh, it's one of the best works of Kurt Vonnegut, which actually brings in this, this paranoid situation. And um, then you have uh, magical realism. Uh, again, if I, which is not new to uh, us, you have Mar uh, Garcia Marquez. Uh, you also have George Borges, two South American writers who have contributed a lot to magical realism. Uh, we have our own Salman Rushdie also uh, in his Midnight's Children, where you have the fantastic and the impossible elements being threaded along with the normal, uh, uh, you know, narrative. So you have uh, diseased characters coming up, complicated plots. Wild shifts in time, myths, fairy tales becoming a part of the narrative. And it is believed that George Borges' Historia Universal de la Infamia is the first work of magic realism. You also have Elizabeth Graver's The Moaning Door, uh, Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Moving on to minimalism and maximalism. Minimalism is giving importance to short works of fiction, uh, employing a terse style. There's deliberate economy of words. You also have mundane subject matter that is only on short stories. Now, minimalism and maximalism were mainly perfected, or it was mainly used by American writers. You have Raymond Carver, Anne Betsy, Mary Robinson, Amy Hembel, Frederick Bartlett. You also have Bobby Ann Mason, Tobias Wolf, Jane Ann Phillips, and Richard Ford. Whereas uh, minimalism is uh, giving importance to terse style with the economy of words, having employing mundane subject matter, mainly focusing on short stories. Maximalism is fiction because it's long and complex, digressive in style. Why there are literally divides and techniques? And it is, it is said that there are 10 main features that you have in maximalism. Although these, all the 10 features may not be found in the works. And these, you have strong symbolic or morphological identity. You, know, uh, you can locate them. Now, what are the 10 features? Length, encyclopedic mode, dissonant chorality, Diegetic exuberance, completeness, narratural omniscience, paranoid in imagination, intersemiosity, ethical commitment, and hybrid realism. 
Now, these are the 10 features. I don't want to elaborate these 10 features right now because it would consume a lot of time. But uh, one must be able to understand that these 10 features are quite ev evident in maximalism. And you find that uh, in these works, uh, a lot of importance is given to the way in which the new media uh, has dominated the cultural landscape. So if these works are nothing but responses to a declining relevance of literary fiction, you know, in a cultural landscape, mainly because of the interference of new media. So these 10 features that I talk about, all the works that are mentioned, or all the works in David Foster Wallace's, Wallace, Jonathan Fraser, Richard Powers, Rick Moji, William Goldman, uh, you know, you also find, you, you find that these are the postmodern American writers in whose works you find maximalism. We also have maximalism, the early writers as Thomas Pynchon, Don G. Lillo, and Paul West. And best examples, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, where you find some, some of these features incorporated. Now, I thought I would just give you a, a, a so most of you know these novels, but then uh, in, let's come to metafiction. Uh, you have this first appearing in uh, William Gass's 1970 essay, Philosophy in the Form of Fiction. So you find uh, metafiction, you have John Barth, Lost in the Sun House, Thomas Pynchon, The Crying of Lot 49, Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse Five, Italo Calvino, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. Now intertextuality of George uh, Borges, there is a, spell, a spelling error there, I'm sorry for that. The Library of Babel, Vladimir Nabokov, Lolita, and in pastiche, you have uh, David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, Ernest Klein's Ready Player One. Now, those employing maximalism, you have Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace, White Teeth by Zadi Smith, Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, Underworld by John Zillow, The Correction by Jonathan Fraser, and Two Six Sixes by Robert Bolano. And hyper reality, you have Guy D. Borghos, The Society of Spectacle, Borderlands, Simulacra and Simulation, which I'll be doing later on, William Gibson in his Neuromancer, Kurt Vonnegut in Harrison. Uh, Bergeron. You have Paranoia in Philip Reed's Mortal Engines and Alan Moore's Watchmen. These are certain works of fiction where you find these elements. Now, fragmentation, uh, you know, in Kurt Vonnegut, so several of these writers have employed several of these techniques. So you could have repetition. The irony, best example is Joseph Heller's Catch 22 and Kurt Vonnegut's Cat Cradle. Now, apart from this, we also have three ways or the three directions in which postmodernism has moved. Principally, the thinkers as uh, Lothard, then you have John Baudelaire and Frederick James. So let us try to first understand what Lothard wants to say. While the postmodernists actually believed in order, stability, and unity, postmodernist thinkers <clears throat> uh, tended to call it meta narrative, especially Lothard. So Lothard mentions that uh, modernism works through meta narratives or grand narratives. Whereas postmodernism questions and deconstructs meta narratives. Now, what exactly is a meta narrative? A meta narrative could be a story about culture. It's a culture, it's a story, it could be a culture that tells about its practices and beliefs. For example, suppose India, our country was to say about its own culture, then it would create, a, there are several instances where uh, it, would, it would be an example of a grand narrative. But then it wouldn't talk about. Uh, those anti-national or uh, uh, elements which are part of its culture. Hence, the meta-narrative that India talks about could create or could talk about untrue conceptions of a society and uh, its movement towards the objective truth, progress, order, and unity would be false. So it is believed that grand narratives hide, silent, and negate contradictions, instabilities, and differences that in are inherent in any social system. Therefore, postmodernism favors mini narratives or, or stories that go local and explain small practices and events without pretending universality and finality. So, postmodernism realizes that history, politics, and culture are grand narratives of the power wielders and, and comprise falsehoods and uh, incomplete truths. So, Lothar was against uh, order, stability, and unity. And hence, he called it meta narrative. And it's this breaking down of the meta narratives, which is nothing but a story or a culture that talks about its beliefs and practices. So, if we talk about a culture of India as a culture, we talk of Indianness, we talk of certain concepts, we could be contributing to a progress, order, unity, of which there are many 
uh, about the antisocial uh, elements and it, several things that are not considered Indian or what is it to be an Indian could be questioned. So instead of going for such meta narratives, personalism favors many narratives that would not favor universality or finality. Uh, so it wouldn't deal with falsehood or incompleteness or incomplete truths. Baudrillard also talks about the first modern stuff as, as he considered to be a simulacra. Now, what is a simulacra? Uh, probably a fake reality that is simulated, that is just created or something that is, that is drawn, you know, induced by the media or other ideological characteristics. So you couldn't, you, but one shouldn't say simulation is just imitation or duplication. Whereas it's a substitution of the original by a simulated image or an, an image that is formed, an image that is created. So, and he talks about the contemporary world is a simulacra and the reality is replaced by false images. Now, to give an example, he talks the Gulf War. Now, we do have not seen the Gulf War, but we read about the Gulf War from newspapers and television reports that has uh, nothing to do with the real Iraq war. So what we get is nothing but a simulated image of the Gulf War. And people are uh, into, uh, uh, the, the simulated image of the Gulf War has become so popular that it seems to be more real than the real war. And hence, Baudel argues that the Gulf War did not take place. So Baudel argues that in the postmodern world, there are no originals, we only have copies. There are no territories, we have only maps. No reality, only simulation. So we, we live, the postmodern world is a world of the make-believe. It's an artificial world. We do not know how to discriminate between the real and the artificial. Yes, Frederick Jameson, who we talked about earlier, talks about postmodern condition, the multinational capitalism and globalization. And he talks of three phases of capitalism. So one, the first phase is the market capitalism in the, 19th, in the 18th and 19th century. You are the second phase, the 20th century. The third is the nuclear electronic technology and consumer capitalism. And this is where we find ourselves in. So in the first phase, you had the realist phase. The second phase, you had the capitalism and modernism, electrical and inter combustion motors. Earlier, it was steam driven. Later, it became driven by electricity. But now the emphasis more on marketing and selling and consumption uh, and then production. We live in a globalized world. So we have multi, uh, multinational marketing or multi-level marketing being given importance to and how is it man gets lost in this particular world now i thought i would just give a comprehensive list of the books that you could refer to you find the christopher butler's postmodernism very short introduction by oxford university press in 2002 could be the best start point to learn about what is postmodernism so uh, this these slides i'll be handing it over to dr Banerjee. so you could take down the names of these books or a screenshot of these books that are very helpful for you to understand uh, uh, what postmodernism is. So we have the postmodern reader by Jen Charles Jenks. Simon uh, Malpass is the postmodern. So the start point, of course, could be Christopher Butler's postmodernism, a short introduction. Uh, you also have Hans Burton and uh, Joseph Nachol, the postmodern key figures. So you could, he, he exhaustively gives all those figures what you are in, involved in um, postmodernism. Uh, yes, you have the other books also, Linda Hutchin and uh, uh, not only Joseph, a postmodern reader. We also have uh, uh, Stuart Sim, the, the Rutledge Companion to Postmodernism. Sim was beginning postmodernism. All these are excellent books that, that you try, not that the others are not, but all these books are very good, give you a good idea of what postmodernism is. And uh, next, I thought I'll just summarize what we have done so far. Uh, so whatever we've learned about postmodernism is this. The social postmodernism is not only a sociocultural literary theory, but it's also shift in perspective. So some elements of postmodernism are also there in modernism. Only thing is, it was viewed in a different angle. It was it manifested itself in all the disciplines in a different way, in a different perspective, or you could say in, in a divergent manner. And this shift in perception began in late 1950s, and probably it still continues. So it's not yet over. It's still continuing. It is manifesting itself in a different way. Now we find the world caught in the consumer capitalism. And so uh, what modernism, uh, that was quite, ev what, uh, uh, quite evident during the, the early parts of the early phase of the 20th century, there is a break when as far as postmodernism is concerned, postmodernism is concerned. And uh, thus you find several 
uh, common features of both modernism and postmodernism. However, the way in which they approach uh, it is quite different. So postmodernism and modernism reject rigid boundaries between high and low art. Postmodernism mixes them, you know. Uh, so, uh, so you you find them, you know, incongruous elements coming together, making this a parody, and the, both of them employed pastiche. You know, uh, so uh, wherein the reader is made to understand that the work is not real, but it's fictional and it's constructed. So whatever discourse we talk about, that's why we say in every discourse, how, how is it the, the construction of the subject is done? How is it that it's constructed within that particular framework? Now, uh, there is fragmentation. Uh, we also have how an individual and a work is subjected to multiple interpretations by the individual. And uh, there is also, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you find uh, the meaning of life, you know, uh, an individual losing himself in, in the world in which he inhabits. That's why you have Tiresias in, in, in Wasteland, who's a representative of an age. And you have both modernism and postmodernism voicing insecurities, disorientation, and fragmentation, mainly because the European powers uh, actually lost their colonies. They were torn apart by the two major world wars, and they came under the impact of uh, social theories, uh, theories like Marxism, postcolonialism, new technologies, the shift of power from Europe to the United States. Now, when I talk about this right now, I'm not referring to America, I'm, or I'm referring to the world as a whole. You find modernism and postmodernism voicing such insecurities, and how modernism leads to postmodernism because of the shift in perception of the way in which it looked at it was quite different. Now, this is again, this is what I was coming to uh, talk about. Uh, both modernism and postmodernism, their works employ fragmentation, decenteredness, and theme and technique. But then it, the way in which it approached the dissimilarity is hidden in the fact that modernism um, actually laments fragmentation and decenteredness of the contemporary world, uh, which it views to be quite tragic. So when there is a loss of unity or center, when the center cannot hold, what happens is there is something known as lamentation. There is panic. There is some, and so that's why we have T.S. Eliot and Wasteland talk about the infertile wasteland, incoherence in the world that is effective in the structure of the poem. And you find uh, he tries to recapture lost meaning by you know, finding a way in which he could bring out unity. He, he tries to take refuge in the Eastern culture. And that's why he, he talks of Datta, Deyadam, and Damyata, and he ends it with Om Shanti, 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 when he takes refuge in Eastern cultures using Tiresias as a protagonist. Whereas postmodernism, it celebrates fragmentation, disorientation. And uh, he talks, he, the postmodernism says that fragmentation and decenteredness is the only way of existence. And there is no need to escape these conditions. There is no need to escape. Now, you find postmodernism. Uh, and post structure sharing certain common facts. So both of them say that you cannot have a coherent center. Center moves towards the periphery, the periphery moves towards the center. So you, the center, which is seat of power, is not entirely powerful. So there is this becoming powerful and becoming powerless. So what happens is the powerless periphery tries to acquire power, so there can never be a center. There are always multiple centers. And the postmodern, the center acquiring power, retaining its position is what Derrida calls difference. And the belief in unity, meaning coherence is continually postponed uh, because of this, of this fragmentation. Now, the disbelief in coherency and unity is also talks about another uh, basic difference between um, modernism and postmodernism. Modernists believe that coherence and unity is possible. So it talks about rationality and order. And the basic assumption that rationality leads to order, which helps us to function better, requires the establishment of the primacy of order. <clears throat> so modernism creates a concept of disorder in its depiction of the other. That includes non-white, non-male, non-heterosexual, non-adult. All that is not white. All that is not male, not heterosexual, not adult, not trash. So to establish a spirit of order, modernism and creates the impression that all that is marginal, all that is peripheral, and these communities as the non-white, non-men are contaminated by disorder. Postmodernism takes the extreme position here. It says, you just want to discuss about order. 
or 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 you know or, or you don't have to discuss anything about being non heterosexual non adult because everything is in disorder so it criticizes binary opposition and suggests that everything is in disorder now there is a denial of objective truth reality uh, it sees everything as the anti essentialist argument that everything is ideologically constructed and the uh, media keep defined to be responsible for constructing the identities in everyday reality so postmodernism developed as a response to the contemporary boom in electronics and communications technologies that revolutionized the old world order so uh, constructivism leads to relativism identities are constructed and transformed every moment in relation to the social environment so there is scope for a uh, multi diverse identities multiple identities multiple truths moral codes and views of reality so there is nothing called objective truths and uh, the importance being given to subjectivity subjectivity is plural is provisional and there was there was renewed interest in local and specific experiences the universal and the abstract so mini narratives were given more importance than grand narratives and the postmodernism relies on a sort of deconstruction wherein uh, there is uh, you know but then it it just question that you know and it's easy to claim the gulf or iraq war does not exist but how do you account for the deaths of and the loss and pain of uh, the people who are victimized by these wars and there is postmodernism offers deep cynicism about the sustenance of social life of culture now it feels that a postmodernism generates a feeling of lack insecurity in contemporary societies and of course you have the third world asserting its eurocentric hegemonic power now uh, postmodernism says that when you empower the periphery this power that the periphery has gained is transient and just as europe that could not retain its imperial power for long the new found power the ostwell well colonies is also under erasure so nothing is stable it projects this instability right now i move on to my third part where we talk about first modern literature in america now early phase in fact was a uh, more of naturalist writing modernist and more experimental writing that was influenced by jean paul sartre and albert camus most of them were black american authors you have richard wright uh, uh, talking about racial injustice and uh, as i told in the first half of my lecture where i told you about the condition of america after the first world war we had a lot of ethnic minority racial groups coming together with their own grievances talking about their conditions in a society that was once racial a society that once believed in hierarchy so you find all these being expressed we have willard motley knock on any door nelson algren the man with the golden arm chandler rosart walk in the darkness and we mainly have fiction here and then i would move on to the others Uh, we also have uh, a novel for i don't know by john hersky where you, these writers talk about war and experience irving shaw the young lions norman mailer the naked and the dead herman walk the king mutiny james jones from here to eternity now in this novel he has used an innovative dark naturalist uh, depiction of war reality the military experience and the misuse of power Now moving out to the Americans, uh, South America, we have uh, Carson uh, McCullers. Uh, we have member uh, the, the Heart is a Lonely Hunter, the member of the Wedding, Eudora Welty with Delta Wedding. Now all these uh, novels uh, made use of Gothic and the grotesque, and you have fantastic and realistic elements coming together, especially in in uh, McCullers, the Heart is a Lonely Hunter. So we find here a gradual shift. Early it was the naturalist and modernist mode, experimental, absurd, and existential. Traditional mode of writing. I know that was in the Sartre and Albert Camus, mainly seen in Black American authors. From there, it moved on to talk of war experience. And when it came to war experience, they found innovative ways of depiction of war reality, the misuse of power, and military experience. And from there on, it again started to bring in fantastic or magical realism. There you find elements into it. Now we also saw Bellows' Dangling Man, Black American, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Selling us the catcher and the rye, all these having the modernist narrative uh, techniques, and they depicted the spirit of the age coming to just. I'm just talking of the period just after the World War 1945. So you find the evolution there happening, and the chaotic urban setting, disintegration of moral values, absurdity, radical rebellion, nihilism, sexuality, alcoholism, 
I should not say that American literature was not influenced by, it was greatly influenced also by Michel Foucault. So you have sexuality, alcoholism, vernacularism, slang, jargon, and there's a lot of expressing a rebellion against standard norms of expression. And you have hence, and some of the early influences, you know, of postmodern writers, one of them is Henry Miller. And he was the first person to bring about the theme of homosexuality that is very much evident in, uh, it was later developed by the beatniks, especially Alan Ginsberg's poetry, uh, Jacques Herup's On the Road, which is a novel. You also have Hubert Selby, his last exit to Brooklyn, uh, Gore Vidal's The Black Pillar, the Black American author James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room in 1956. Again, William Burroughs is another beatnik writer who talks of uh, sexual, alcoholic, and drug fantasies, with his protagonist, The Naked Lunch. So here you have hallucinations, fantasies, fragmented, paranoid narration. Now, Charles Olson was the next influence for the postmodern writers. He was a part, he was a rector actually of the, of the Black Mountain College. And Olson's poetry here, um, seen in his collection, the Maximus poems. And here he talked about um, something known as happening. Uh, now, what is this happening as far as poetry is concerned here? Uh, or in, mainly in verse, uh, we also have, I'll just describe that later on. You have Charles Olson, Mary Caroline uh, Richards, uh, John Cage in music, Robert Rosenberg, uh, pop painter in 1952. So you'll find, uh, first of all, is, as, as we all know, it's not only a part of literature, but also it covers all the arts. But then there is an experimentation with metrical uh, units, uh, connect, poetry was closely connected to life, art experience, and it was not considered a separate activity. So importance was given to open, uh, you know, open public. It was uh, studies alone for the people to So use of materials, forms, and techniques from other parts like Facebook and artistic was foreign yeah, also at Alan earlier banned community, but later it was accepted. So William Burroughs with his depiction of homosexuality and drug addiction in his donkey. Similarly, Jack Herouk, uh, you know, in his poetry, and uh, especially in his manifest novel On the Road, he talks of oriental mysticism, mobility, jazz. <clears throat> then you also have uh, uh, the, the dharma bums and the subterraneans. Now, another most other most important writers are John Hawkes, which is Cannibal in 1949, William Gaddis, who is most important with the recognition, Vladimir uh, Nabokov, Lolita, John Bart's Floating Opera, William Burroughs, Naked Lunch, and they employed all sorts of techniques that we discussed earlier as black humor, irony, fragmentation, metafiction elements, parody, overlapping of fact, fiction, fantasy, dreams uh, that were formerly considered the taboo, you know, the uh, pedophilia, drug addiction, mixing of genres, arts. So you find by the 1960s, postmodern fiction America had developed or it was, it had reached its peak at during that time and it's still developing these days. So American postmodern fiction 1960s was largely uh, employed linguistic play, experiments with language, referential function of language, irony, parody, fragmentation, intertextuality, overlapping of fact, fiction, and dreams, use of several techniques, different genres, kinds of arts and media. And hence, it was known as anything goes type of narratives. <clears throat> so you have storytelling and imagination coming together, imagination as a liberating force, linguistic and philosophical theories as post structuralism and deconstruction providing skeptical views of positive language to express the objective truth or an understanding of a subject as a coherent unified whole and emphasizing the active role of a reader in the construction of meaning. <clears throat> now we also have <clears throat> how the media had its manipulative and stimulating power. Uh, you have sci-fi, horror, love stories, <clears throat> media programs, TV shows. Uh, they were parodied, William Garris, John Barr, Tom Spinchin. Richard Brotigan, Donald Bartholomew, you have Robert Coover, Kurt Vonnegut, and all of them especially contributing to this tendency of 
uh, you know, using the power of media and popular culture influencing people's vision of the world. And all this happened in the 1970s. And the, we also have ethnic, sexual, and gender identities. <clears throat> the, 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 the ways in which all these identities are being questioned. We have rep their representations in diverse works. The question of personal literature, a culture, giving a point of some marginality, that brand, we also have ethnic identities. Yes, we must talk ethnic cultures too. You have Jamaica, King Kate, or the host of Afro-American authors. Leslie Marmon Silko, Gerald Wiesner, Sherman Alexei, Rex Sarah, Lewis uh, Erdrich, Asian American authors, Saxing Hawkinson, Amy Tan, Mika had Don Bharti Mukherjee, the Hispanic American writers are Sandra uh, Cisneros, Gloria Anzaldua, Julia Anvaris, Anna Castillo, and a host of other of the writers. So I wish you would all explore uh, this particular American literature to see how America was not only uh, a, a country to, there's nothing called a pure American, how all these hybrid cultures are being used. So uh, talking about culture, you have oral tradition, myth, mysticism. You are the trickster figure, especially coming up in their work. And uh, we also have uh, postmodern writers like Casey Acker, John Russ, Susan Sontag, you know, uh, deconstruct the typical have these genres of popular literature, such as pornography and sci fi. So, uh, there you also the cyberpunk novel again. You have William Gibson, Michael Joyce, Michael Serres, John Russ, Ursula Le Guin, uh, Cathy Acker, all of them contributed into postmodern literature. Yes, and we also have films, uh, postmodern films also coming up in cyberpunk novel. Uh, actually, this, the word cyberpunk is from cybernetics and punk, coined by Bruce Bethke. And after the title of the short story, Cyberpunk was published in 1983. Here also you have this <clears throat> manipulation perception of the vision of reality, the distinction of the real and virtual, fact and fiction, reality and hallucination. All these distinctions are blurred here. So to tell us about an alternative existence, uh, where, you, where uh, you have suppressed desires and for the liberating force of such suppressed desires, emphasize the power of imagination, use the uh, postmodern parody, and hence you find the reason which are the artists represent the past, represent the present, represent the future, not giving importance to the time, just shifting or moving from the past to the present to the future. And we also have Blade Runner, uh, which is adapted from Philip uh, Dick's Do and Run of Electric Sheep, the Matrix trilogy, Screamers, Minority Report, Paycheck, Scanner, Darkly. Now, <clears throat> American authors, especially, one could say uh, these are, like, you know, they were known as uh, super fictionists. Some of them are sur fictionists or mid fictionists, writing according to in the post the post contemporary age. The way in which they employed the semantic playfulness of text, broadly used postmodern parody radical irony, metafictional techniques, uh, radically fragmented level of narrative line, depiction of characters, setting, and the whole composition. Now, <clears throat> apart from this, we also have a John Barth's uh, Sword Weed Factor, Thomas Pynchon's Prize, 1962, Confederate uh, General from Big Sur, Vladimir uh, Nabokov Lolita. Again, you have Robert Coover, the Universal Baseball Association, William Gass, The Heart, of the heart, sorry, in the heart of the country. Uh, you have uh, Ronald uh, Suckings, up, Jersey Kosinski Steps, Richard Rottigan's Trout Fishing in America, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, all these were published during that time. Now, <clears throat> when we talk of uh, prose writing, we have Audra Welty, Raymond Carver, John Cheever, Alice Walker. Uh, poetry, we have Sylvia Plath, uh, Marion Monroe, and Sexton, Benjolin Brooks, and Adrian Rich. Moving to drama, we have Edward Albee, Edward Albee's zoo story. Uh, and then you also have The Sandbox, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, one of his uh, landmark works, The Delicate Balance and Three Tall Women. When we talk of Arthur Miller, the most important work is Death of the Salesman, The Doctor of the American Dream, and All My Sons, The Crucible. We also have uh, Incident at Witchery, The Prize, and The Arm Clock. Now, when we talk of Tennessee Williams, uh, Tennessee Williams was actually Thomas uh, Lanyon Williams. His pseudonym is Tennessee Williams. Desire Roof, The Glass Menagerie, which is the most popular drama, Catch on the Hot Tip. 
talking of Lorraine Hansberry's Razor in the Sun to be young, gifted and black. What it was, we talk of August Wilson. You have the collection of 10 plays for the Pittsburgh Cycle. Uh, David Mamet, uh, Oleana, American Buffalo, See the Plow, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, some of his important works. And again, you have a host of writers, a fiction writers, a Saul Bellow, Ralph Ellison, John Abbott. Some of these writers we've already discussed. You have Thomas Pynchon, E.L. Doctorow, James Baldwin, and Tony uh, Morrison. Now, uh, Tony Morrison, when you talk of Tony Morrison, uh, how could you forget the bluest eye? Uh, you have Beloved, your Song of Solomon, Sula, Tar Baby, Jazz, Paradise, and uh, God Help Child, uh, 2015 some of her uh, representative works. Yes, so uh, I thought this is all I have to tell you about American literature. And I wish uh, this is not the end of the postmodern American literature. Uh, several of these writers have still written and uh, which is uh, gaining uh, popularity and uh, which is still evolving, evolving uh, as far as uh, uh, we are concerned. It's, it is uh, evolving itself where you have uh, different ways in which these writers have projected themselves, or uh, ways in which these writers have talked about uh, their uh, interests, talked about their present, about the ways in which uh, they could experiment with, uh, uh, they could actually uh, experiment uh, on a varied subjects in relation to the changes that are happening. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, such a lucid presentation. Uh, words are not enough to express my gratitude for presenting such an important presentation uh, and such an important phase uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, American literature in such a very you know, uh, lucid manner, covering almost all the points and uh, uh, you know, uh, putting in a lot of hard work. So it was something which we should all learn, inculcate from you, the habit of thoroughly going through a particular topic and how to present it. The flow that you spoke and the points that you covered are re really admirable. We, we really admire the way you presented. Thank you so much always uh, for... Uh, accepting our invitation and talking on topics which are so uh, you know complex and so vast and lengthy uh, thank you sir thank you so much for the opportunity you gave me ma'am we are honored to have you <laughs> on our platform and uh, i think the participants are not aware but the next uh, online series that we are having on movements of of the various ages Ma'am is also kind enough to come on that as well. And she'll be speaking on something very pertinent, very postmodern on topics that she will be speaking. I will share with the participants. Uh, we are in the final stages. So within a day or two, I will share the list. I no think, uh, yeah, uh, I think this is one of the most important uh, lecture series that we'll be having from 11th. And uh, the movements that we are covering I think so far, so far, no one has yet covered. So well, the topics that we are covering in the movements, uh, I, I, as per my understanding and my research, no one else so far has covered in India those many movements in one lecture series. Yes, yes, yes. So, I did have. I, I could see. I did get uh, your uh, points as far as your brochure. You sent me uh, the concept of the promised land. Uh, questions related to that and uh, also questions related to uh, yes uh, projective works by charles olson tennessee williams and arthur miller do they actually belong to the postmodernist era why did i take up their uh, actually uh, you know uh, do they belong to modern literature or postmodern era now uh, i thought i would take up only one or two questions not all because uh, the other questions i think i have to explain them in detail uh, because when you see these questions uh, we feel are very pertinent, and I will take up only one question right now. I'm thoroughly exhausted. I'm sorry to say that, but then I thought uh, the students, the participants, have also put out such interesting questions that I believe I must take time to answer. But today, for the timing, sir, I just don't want to disappoint the 
uh, participants. I'll take up just one question, sir. Uh, when we talk about the projective verse, Charles, have a lot Just a second, ma'am. Before you answer that question, I will uh, request the participants mm -hmm. to please put, uh, put in, type in the questions, your questions, so that I can gather all the questions and I can mail it to ma'am. So you please type, continue typing your questions in the chat box if you have questions so that I can mail the same to ma'am and we will get the answers and I will share with you. Yeah, yes, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, so yeah. I'll just talk about Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller. Now, whether, what does it mean by a writer belonging to an era, whether it is postmodern literature or uh, do they employ postmodern techniques in their works? Now, <clears throat> if we talk about Arthur Miller or Tennessee Williams, uh, their works, that span the era after the Second World War. Several of their works, not all, some of their works do come. So you not only find modern uh, mod, um, techniques of modernism being employed in their drama, but you also find certain postmodern techniques being used by them. That's why I decided to or, uh, you know, talk about Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller here, especially because you find several of those, several or at least aspects of postmodernism interfering with their drama. So uh, it's not important to say whether they are modern or they are postmodern. Again, I told you there is no such strict distinction in literature between postmodernism. I told you postmodernism has evolved out of modernism. Several features of modernism are found in postmodernism, of course, with slight differences. So for the very fact that both Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller their writings have incorporated several elements of postmodernism. I thought I would mention about Arthur Miller and uh, Tennessee Phillips. Okay, ma'am. I would just answer to this one. Yeah. Uh, but so, the other questions, I'm sure, sir, if you could just send me the questions, I yeah. would. Uh, I would. Uh, That's what I have. I have, I have asked. Uh, oh, we always are very thankful, ma'am. Whenever you come, it's an honor for all of us to have you to discuss with you, to talk to you. You are so busy, you are engaged in so many things. Uh, you prepare for MOOCs, you are in, into IGNU, you are into regular teaching, you hold very important positions in your college and your, in your university and various academic endeavors that, that you are engaged in. And still you, you make it a point that whenever I reach out to you, uh, you accept uh, my invitation on, on behalf of Dad Voyage. And so it's an absolute honor, words are not enough, ma'am. Uh, uh, and uh, we really look forward every time we meet. I look forward personally. I look forward a lot of positive things to learn from a very very erudite uh, academician like you. So thank you once again on behalf of Team Dark Voyage, thank you, sir. and thank, uh, you so thank you so much. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to have you. And see you again on twenty fourth, I guess, on the last day of uh, the movement uh, course, which okay. we are starting from eleventh of April. Okay. Uh, the okay. details, ma'am, I will share within a few days. Uh, we are Fine. in the final stages. Fine. Just one or two topics we just have to clarify with our resource person. Because as you know, we have some norms. <laughs> that yes, we, yes, I do understand. We, we I request do understand. our resource person with a, just an objective, ma'am, to help uh, the academia. Uh, yeah, we sure. have those norms as discussed uh, just to help the academia so that the, you know, the, the effort does not end here with the lecture but carries on and, and gets transformed in the form of a book which yes, will be yes. helpful for all of us. Yes. So, yes. thank you so uh, actually much, Actually, the time that was given to me was 6 to 8, but I was yes, quite apprehensive because I did not want to lose my internet connection. So, yeah. I'm so happy that this time there's no interruption of any sort. Hmm. Uh, and I was, that's why I was a bit uh, pretty fast with my presentation. I do not know if it has affected the quality of your program uh, because uh, I do not know we could have an internet an interruption anytime. So I did not want that to happen because this is a very important uh, topic. Yeah. No, no, ma'am. Uh, this time we, we did not have any technical glitch. Oh, so great. I'm so happy uh, thanks about to, that. <laughs> thanks to <laughs> yes. the internet services there at your hand. I was very apprehensive because we are having, uh, you know, cats and dogs raining here for the last okay. one hour. Okay. But okay. Uh, by God's grace, uh, we, we our weather is like Kerala only. Uh, okay, okay. like from here now we have started our rainy season from april and it will oh. go on till september and october so oh. and it rains profusely sometimes okay okay, so okay thank god that everything was okay smooth okay, and, yes yes, yes. Uh, i was actually worried about starting it at six o'clock because six o'clock the time and everything is down we have mm. more number of people over the internet so that anything could happen so mm. i was praying god you know nothing happens and fortunately <laughs> uh, you know everything has gone yeah 
thank you so much ma'am it was thank a pleasure you, see you soon ma'am take thank care you. and all the best ma'am for thank your you, tomorrow's endeavor thank you so okay, much thank you sir take thank care ma'am thank you thank you thank you good night good night good night sir good night